The beginning of the 20th century is a time of rapid development of technology. There has been a huge breakthrough in almost all technical industries. The first tanks, planes, submarines, and airships appeared. If, for example, tanks and planes were just acquiring the necessary features and were more like children's crafts, then submarines and airships in their appearance have hardly changed in a hundred years. Submarines will be a separate interesting investigation, but I will tell you about airships today. This is what is written about airships in the book 1935th Year Airships. Buildings Abroad The airship, capable of ultra-long flights, is one of the most formidable military means of our era, one of the means of fighting against the proletarian revolution. That is why the study of capitalist airship construction is an urgent task for us. This was all written in 1935th year, when serious armed battles were already taking place on fighter jets in the sky. Now let's compare the capabilities of two different types of aircraft of the early 20th century and see which type of aircraft should have received priority development due to its set of characteristics such as reliability, cost of flight, cheapness of manufacture, and the possibility of building a huge number of such vessels using well-known technologies and factories of the early 20th century. To compare the capabilities of an airplane and an airship of the early 20th century, we have a very interesting historical fact. In 1913, the British newspaper Daily May established a special prize of £10,000 for the first flight across the Atlantic Ocean. The prize aroused great interest, and several aviation engineers began to make plans to win it. But the War of 1914 forced the postponement of all plans for transatlantic flights. The First World War pushed back the plans for a flight across the ocean. On the other hand, it was able to bring this flight closer in technical terms. During the First World War, aviation made a qualitative leap, turning from an exotic toy into a real combat force. RAG biplanes have grown into more reliable machines like Ilya Maramets. No one had specialized bombers at the beginning of the First World War, except Russia. Our engineer Igor Sikorsky did what the aviation community at the beginning of the 20th century considered impossible at all. He placed four motors in one row on the wing of a huge plane. This will not surprise anyone today, but then skeptics argued that if at least one engine fails, there will be a turning moment that will certainly overturn the plane. However, Igor Ivanovich did not hold the position of chief designer of the Russian Baltic plant for nothing. He checked everything with calculations and was confident in his idea. As a result, on the 27th of April 1913, Grant rose into the air. A huge biplane, 20 meters long, by the standards of wooden canvas aviation. It was equipped first with two, and later with four Argus engines of 100 horsepower each. Then a car of this size was associated exclusively with a sea vessel so no one called it an airplane, but only an airship. I have adopted a lot of their steamships. In front, outdoor balcony for walking, wicker chairs in the salon, toilet. On its nose was a double-headed eagle, and the names, as on all warships of the Russian Imperial Navy. After a number of improvements, the device received a new name, the Russian Knight. On the 11th of September, 1913, a small Meller airplane of the Moscow Ducks factory flew over it, from which the engine broke off. The pilot managed to safely plan to the airfield and land the Meller, but the ill-fated engine fell on the left wing of the night, destroying it. Instead of the dead giant, in December of 1913th year, a new, more advanced military aircraft Ilya Maramets was built, which became the first in a series of such four-engine bombers of the Russian army. According to tradition, the military first appointed him as a scout, and since he was an airship, he was also assigned to the Baltic fleet, putting floats instead of wheels. On December 21, 1914, all the Muramites were brought together into a single unit, which received a completely naval name, a squadron of airships. This squadron became the world's first heavy bomber unit. In the people, Military aircraft were dubbed offensively not romantic, flying bookcases. During the First World War, 65 Morovits were built, 
which had some design differences. For example, the ships of one of the most massive modifications and had a length of 17 and a half meters and a span of the upper wing of 30 meters. The empty plane weighed three and a half tons and before takeoff with gasoline and engine oil, with a crew of six people with four machine guns, half a ton of bombs, the plane weighed up to five tons. The tanks located under the fuselage contained a thousand liters of gasoline, which was enough for a flight with a range of 600 kilometers. The engines on different versions of the ship were different, so on one of the most famous B-9 with its own name Kievsky, there were four Argus of 140 horsepower, accelerating it to 120 kilometers per hour. The construction technologies were modern epochs. The wooden ash frame of the fuselage sheathed with plywood in the area of the pilot's cabin and fabric in the tail on the lower wings it was possible to climb out of the cabin through hatches. It was necessary to repair damaged engines in the air. It has happened more than once that a motor mechanic saved a downed plane like that. Machine guns of different systems could be mounted on special racks. In addition, a cavalry carbine and light machine guns were often taken into flight to fire at enemy fighters. With the appearance of armed airplanes among the Germans and Austrians, attempts to shoot down the Muramites who were annoying them were often made. However, it is not for nothing that the Kaiser pilots nicknamed the big Russian planes hedgehogs. During the entire war, only one Murom was shot down. In the armies of the countries of the Triple Alliance, multi-engine bombers appeared only in 1916th year. These were the German twin-engine years. The backward us aviation did not have time to use its first twin-engine bomber Glenn Martin in battle, which took off only in August of 1918th year. At the beginning of the First World War, the basis of Kaiser Wilhelm's air forces were Count Seppelin's combat airships. A 140-meter cigar could fly at a speed of 80 kilometers per hour for a huge distance. Separated by the strait, England was quite within reach. The airships had defensive machine gun weapons, and a rigid frame with gas balloons inside made them not too susceptible to shelling. At the beginning of the war, the Zeppelins were the terror of Europe. On the 14th of August, 1914, only one such airship completely destroyed 60 houses and damaged about 900 more during the bombing of Antwerp. However, in 1915, incendiary bullets were invented, immediately depriving hydrogen-filled airships of invulnerability. After that, Count Seppelin, together with a team of famous German engineers, created the world's largest wooden aircraft. The Seppelin Staken R6, in 1916th year, the span of the upper wing of the biplane was 42 meters, which is almost 8 meters more than the Boeing 737, and all this is assembled from sticks and rags. The Titanic weighed more than 7 tons and could carry up to 2 tons of bombs at short range or 1,200 kilograms of bombs. At full range, reaching 800 kilometers, the bomber was equipped with four Mercedes water-cooled engines of 260 horsepower each which were installed in pairs, in two motor year ones. One engine at the front with a pulling propeller, the second at the back with a pushing one. In each motorcycle gondola, a mechanic sat between the engines, servicing the engines in flight. Interestingly, the pilot could not control the engines from his seat in any way. Commander Seppelin Stocken, like the captain of a naval ship, only gave the motorists commands to increase or decrease revs, and they already directly controlled the motors. To transmit commands, a garden machine telegraph first served, which was then replaced by a pneumatic mail. The crew consisted of ten people. They could defend themselves with the help of four or six Parabella machine guns of caliber 762. To beat the lone Seppelin Stocken, the British had to use 18 fighters. The navigator in flight was guided by the sun and the stars with the help of a sextant and a chronometer. The maximum speed of the miracle technique reached 130 kilometers per hour. In the period from 1916th to 1917th years, 18 such ships were built. Now back to the first transatlantic flight. After the First World War, the design and production of airplanes ceased to be the lot of eccentric enthusiasts and became a powerful industry with serious engineering teams. In addition to the money of 10,000 pounds, the first transatlantic flight promised developers good advertising, so aircraft companies did not stand aside. In May 1919, pilot Hawker and navigator Grief McKenzie 
took off on the Sopwith Atlantic airplane. The attempt was unsuccessful. The plane crashed into the ocean. The pilots were rescued. Around the same time, several U.S. Navy flying boats flew from Newfoundland to Portugal via the Azores. The purpose of the flight was to practice flights over the sea. There was no record because the flight lasted 19 days and the planes had a large number of landings. On the 14th of June, 1919, an airplane built on the Vickers film took off from a pasture near St. John's on the island of Newfoundland. The length of the aircraft is 13 meters, the wingspan is 21 meters. The whole plane was made of wood, including three meter screws. This is a serial twin engine bomber that did not have time to participate in the First World War. For a transatlantic flight, the aircraft was slightly modified. First of all, all military equipment was removed from it. Additional fuel tanks were installed. The pilots sat side by side on a narrow wooden bench. The fuel reserve for the transatlantic flight was 4,000 liters. The next morning, June 15, 1919, the Vickers plane reached the shores of Ireland. In 15 hours and 57 minutes, the plane covered 3,000 kilometers, setting a world record. This was the first non-stop flight across the Atlantic Ocean. The next most famous flight over the Atlantic was made by Charles Lindbergh in 1927th year. He took off from New York on a specially designed biplane. Its length is 8 meters, wingspan is 14 meters, fuel tank capacity is 1,700 liters. Lindbergh took off from New York and landed in Paris in 33 hours and 30 minutes. In 1927th year, people learned to fly non-stop across the Atlantic Ocean. It seems to be a huge achievement. And now let's look at the possibilities of airships built around the same period. The airship LZ-127 Count Seppelen was built in Germany in 1928th year, length 230 meters, diameter 30. The power plant consisted of five Maybach engines with a capacity of 530 horsepower each. The engines were running on gas. Gasoline was taken on board as a backup fuel. The payload of the airship was 25 tons, cruising speed 115 kilometers per hour. Flight range 10,000 kilometers, crew 40 people. From below, directly to the hull, the front gondola was attached, the length of which is 40 meters, the width is 6 meters. In the front part, there was a control room, behind it service, and other passenger rooms. In terms of comfort, Count Seppelen significantly surpassed the aircraft of those years. Passengers were accommodated in 10 double cabins equipped with sleeping places. In the front part of the passenger compartment, there was a spacious mess room, which could accommodate 28 people at the same time. The kitchen was designed to serve more than 50 people for several days. Count Seppelen was the first airship to open passenger transportation across the Atlantic. The first flight to New York took place on the 11th of October, 1928th year. The approach lasted 111 hours. There were 40 crew members and 20 passengers on board. The return flight took only 71 hours and 49 minutes. In August 1929th year, the airship carried out the first round-the-world flight in the history of aeronautics. Starting at Lakehurst, Count Seppelen covered more than 30,000 kilometers in 20 days, with an average speed of 115 kilometers per hour while making only three intermediate landings. From the 18th of May to the 6th of June, 1930, Seppelen made a round trip to South and North America. In 1931st year, regular flights to Brazil began. On September 10, 1930, RAF Seppelen flew to Moscow. And on July 26, 1931, he flew over a significant part of the Soviet Arctic for scientific purposes while taking detailed aerial photographs. For nine years of operation, Count Seppelen spent 17,200 hours in the air, having made 590 flights to different countries of the world, having overcome almost 1,700,000 kilometers, transported 13,110 passengers, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean 143 times, and once the Pacific. In 1937th year, after the disaster of the Ginderberg airship, Count Seppelen's regular flights were discontinued. 
the end of the German Dirigeblestruinia occurred at the beginning of the Second World War, when in the spring of 1940, by order of the German command, the airship Count Seppelin and Count Seppelin II, built in 1938th year, were dismantled. Using the example of Zeppelin-type airships, we see that technologies that allowed transporting thousands of people and tens of tons of cargo, for some reason, ceased to be developed after 1937th year. When planes built of wood were just beginning to cross the Atlantic Ocean with great risk, the airship, based on the technologies of 1913, easily transported passengers across the Atlantic. Airships make almost non-stop round-the-world trips. The first intercontinental air passenger transportation opens on airships. It was almost an ideal form of air transport. The first airships were filled with hydrogen. It seems to be a very explosive gas, but Count Seppelin made 590 flights, and after that, it did not burn down, but it was simply dismantled. At the same time, the Ginderberg airship that rose in 1936th year was designed to use helium as a carrier gas, but due to the US embargo, helium had to be replaced with hydrogen. It turns out that already in 1936th year, a completely safe airship was designed and built, which could travel around the world, an ideal aircraft, which was abandoned only because of one disaster. Planes have been developing by the hundreds during these years, but for some reason, the world governments have not abandoned the production of aircraft. So why did they abandon the airships, almost the best aircraft of that time? We will not consider military actions, since during the First World War, it turned out that airships could not withstand incendiary bullets. But these are airships filled with hydrogen. I think that an airship filled with helium will be safer than an airplane under fire with incendiary shells. Let's say that airships are less effective during military operations, but why abandon the use of airships in peacetime? After all, this is a unique type of transport that does not require expensive runways. An airship can take off somewhere in the African desert and land somewhere in the Siberian tundra. No other type of air transport can do this. An airliner can fly the same distance but it needs equipped airfields for takeoff and landing. A modern helicopter can rise and land in any terrain, but it is limited by the flight range. So why did they abandon the best air vehicle after all? There are many versions. The most common thing is that the world's governments are promoting gasoline technology. And in order for the world to consume more gasoline, First of all, electric cars were abandoned at the beginning of the 20th century, then airships, since airplanes consume more fuel and therefore oil companies have more profits. But I completely disagree with this. A huge airship also consumes a lot of fuel, and if tens of thousands of airships were flying in the sky, then the demand for fuel would be the same as it is now. The ban on airships is not related to the policy of the oil lobby. He benefits from airships, as well as modern airliners. So the ban is related to something else. And that's another thing, our freedom of movement. If the development of airships had not been forcibly stopped in the 40s, now any more or less wealthy person could have bought a blimp for the price of a modern yacht and could travel the world, regardless of borders and the presence of modern airports. You can, of course, buy a private jet now, but it will not give you the freedom of travel that an airship will give. A modern jet plane can transfer from one continent to another, but it will have to take off from an equipped airport and land at the airport too. You can buy a small or medium helicopter and land anywhere, but here we have another problem travel distance restrictions. Probably, in the 40s of our century, the authorities for some reason were afraid that people would be able to inspect distant territories independently and uncontrolled by the authorities. They probably had something to hide. Perhaps the world we see on the maps is not quite the same as in reality.
I'm not saying the earth is flat, I don't know what it is. But, even on the round earth, the authorities are hiding something from us. Take the same Australian fences that stretch four thousands of kilometers, which, according to the official version, prevent the migration of rabbits. Or, for example, the territories near the Novoya Zemli archipelago. Antarctica is also very interesting. If the development of airships had not been banned, tens of thousands of people could have inspected these lands back in the middle of the 20th century, because then there were no such powerful border cordons equipped with modern radars. Now, even on an airship, they won't let you look at the shores of Antarctica, but in the 50s, there was still a chance for this. I think that in the 40s, the opportunities of ordinary people in exploring certain territories were specifically limited. Now, when the world is under the gun of thousands of radars, airships are being built again, because any object in the sky is controlled by the authorities anyway, and even the best airship will not escape from the rocket. That's it, watch my channel.